Arch Advocate Podcast for Thursday. Welcome back, everybody. April 4th. April 4th day. Uh, listen, I appreciate you guys. All of the messages that we that, that I received, even even the people who were being assholes. I, seriously, I, I, I don't care. I just appreciate the feedback. To answer all of your questions in one broad swoop, let me just say, we'll get there. Right? This I'm not going to do a Fox News or a CNN and just and just blurt out a bunch of stuff and hope that you figure it out. I don't like that. That's how things get lost. I don't like losing things. There was a terrorist training camp in New Mexico, and everybody has forgotten all about that. Right? Remember September 11th? Like we're, we'll never forget. Never forget. It's like oh no, we've forgotten. Right? Because of the barrage, the endless. 24 hours news cycle, which, by the way, started in uh, Bush Sr.'s administration. There was, no, there was never, before uh, uh, Operation, Operation Desert Shield, there was no such thing as a 24-hour news cycle. Somebody came on the news, they told you a story, and you had to think about it for weeks and months. Because there was, it wasn't just an ongoing barrage. I don't like, I don't like that. And I'm not going to do that. I'm going to take my time. Now, I don't have, I, I, I don't have access to the information to give a full breakdown on what actually happened in the Vegas shooting, or Charleston, or you know what I mean. But I do on this one, right? Because I did a, I did a short video, and I had uh, hundreds, several hundred. People wrote in, and nearly every single one of them had a different finger to point. And then I get a hold. Uh, one of the people who wrote me, Adam Cairns, that's who's joining us on our show today, that's who joined us yesterday, and he is a he, he's uh, a freelance journalist on, on top of several other qualifications. All right, so he's he he has a perspective that's that is. Uh, verifiably more informed. He's been in communication with New Zealand police. He's been in communication with you know various news organizations in New Zealand. He's had a particular set of experiences, and so I can I can trust like the the information that we go over that we we can get in depth and because wh whenever there's when whenever there is a set of uh, circumstances that all are surrounding this one thing and each one of those circumstances is just if, if you're not if you're not raising your eyebrow to it it's like well then I, I doubt your capacity to ask questions you don't find anything wrong with this aspect or that aspect it's like okay, well then I guess you're not paying attention to it maybe you're caught up in the in the in the latest news cycle that uh, you know, Congress is trying to subpoena Donald Trump's tax records. Maybe you're caught up in the fact that, you know, Joe Biden is a creep. Maybe that's what you're focused on. Maybe, you know, who knows what it is. But, you know, whatever. I don't, you know, I have the luxury. I have my own show. I can slow the mechanism down and say, well, hold on a second. Let's, let's take this piece by piece because there seems to be something greater uh, something more veiled in darkness going on in this story. So thank you for all of the comments. Please keep them coming. But if you ask me a question like, well, what about this aspect? S send me that aspect just in case nobody else has seen it the way that you've seen it. And then keep in mind, we'll get there. All right. We can't, I, I can't do it in an hour. If you want, if, if, if you want news in an hour, you know, go watch Tucker Carlson, who I like. You know, go watch Anderson Cooper, who I don't like. But if that's what you want, if that's the food that you want to eat, this isn't, you've come to the wrong restaurant. We're going to break this down. Now, after yesterday's show, uh, Adam had written me a message and said, oh, you know what, there's, there's this one thing I, I kind of wish I, I would have brought up to talk about it. And, uh, you know, what we're going to talk about it today. But first, if you are new to the show, if you're listening on a podcast like on your device would you please find that subscribe button and push it please it's a huge help I, I'm not gonna go into why that's a big help but please do that and also hit share to your social media platforms trying to get that Google money son 
And if you want to support the show with dough, you can find me at uh, paypal.me slash archadvocate. Paypal.me slash archadvocate. Support the things you love, people, or else they go away, as Owen Benjamin always says. Now, listen, Adam Cairns, welcome back to the show. Thank you very much for joining us. Oh, welcome. Thank you very much for having me back. Now, uh, you brought up an interesting thing yesterday after uh, we were done recording the podcast and after we had gotten over the phone. Uh, why, don't you, why don't you give us a breakdown of, of what you wrote me? Sure. Uh, I came across something online here. Uh, it was official that apparently... You know, when we were discussing sourcing the manifesto and the, the difficulty doing so, well, apparently it just got more difficult because there is a, a apparently a weaponized version of it okay. floating around the internet. All right. So uh, apparently it was uh, coded uh, by a vigilante named Maori, uh, M-A-O-R-I. Maori. Uh, yeah, Ma- Maori. Ma- Maori um, is the, the indigenous peoples of New Zealand. Yeah, so... I guess he was trying to uh, thwart its distribution on, online. Uh, you know, when it's clicked on, it forces a, a system reboot that ends with a black screen featuring the message, this is not us. Um, you know, the, the hacked version was actually discovered by a security firm called Blue Hexagon, uh, which dubbed it the Trojan Hacker. Uh, they thought initially it was merely targeting press, but it looks like it's targeting uh, anyone trying to get a copy of the literature. Okay. All right. So once again, uh, beware, right? I had one person write into me uh, yesterday and they said, uh, oh, it just sounds like you spent most of your time asking uh, your guest, like, how do I get the information? Dude, if I want the information, I'll get it. All right. If I want the manifesto, if I want the video, I will get it. I don't need I, I don't need anybody for that. When I when I ask questions about, you know, the the the. The problem that that I believe is being exposed when you point out the fact that that on a global scale, on the whole planet, within hours of this happening, all of that information was taken down and scrubbed. That's a that's a that's a problem, and you know that's that was the point of of starting off the show yesterday. Like there is it. There are powerful people doing powerful things that that they don't have the right to do. They don't. They weren't asked to do it. There were no legal uh, compulsions to do what they did. They just did it. That's a problem. It's not their place to do that. And so when we have uh, all of a sudden we have, um, you know, you might be listening to show to this show and decide that you want to dive into your own investigation by looking for the manifesto or looking for the original video. I wanted to to start this show off just with this one little aspect of be careful with what you accept on your uh, on your computer device. If you think that you're going to go try to download the manifesto or or the original video. You might want to go to an internet cafe. Use somebody else's computer, right? I know that's kind of a dick move, but you, know, <laughs> you don't you don't want your own laptop crashing, right? So uh, just be beware, you know, because because once again, and I I'm I'm not suggesting that those two things are uh, um, tied together. And I'm not saying that they're not. What I am saying is that there is a there is a verifiable threat to you if you try to download the manifesto or the original video. So be warned. That's all I'm saying. Be careful. Careful out there. So Adam, uh, you know I've 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 kind of resigned myself to just letting you you know take the lead on this dance. Uh, what are we talking about today? Uh, just who Brenton Tarrant is. Brenton uh, Tarrant. Yeah, why he wasn't on the scope with uh, New Zealand authorities. You know, and just a, a bit about his background. Okay, Brenton Tarrant is the uh, shooter, the the man arrested for uh, killing forty nine people, or fifty, or whatever the the number is now. Who is this guy? What's what's peculiar about him? Well, his early years. Um, seemed totally unremarkable. Uh, he was born out in uh, Grafton, Australia. 
Um, you know, neighbors, family said he was always a polite kid, didn't hold any extremist views, had no interest in firearms. Um, you know, he, he grew up there, graduated high school there. Uh, he worked his one job there at Big River Gym uh, for two years. Uh, and af- after leaving the gym, that's that's when it gets weird. Okay. How About how old was he when he was done being a workout guy? Uh, well, looking back at the dates, uh, he, he must have left the gym when he was 20 years old. Okay, he's so a young man. Yeah, so he's been floating around in the ether for about, you know, eight years with no job. He's 28 now? He's 28 now, yeah. Okay, all right. Where, where has he been? Oh, jeez, all over. Um, you know, his father passed in 2010, uh, suicide. Apparently, he mm. got really sick from an asbestos-related illness, uh, decided he didn't want to go through all the pains that that was going to bring. All right. Uh, so, Brenton did her- uh, inherit uh, a bit of an estate, uh, some inheritance. Um, you know, he did say he was from a very low-income family, so I don't know how big uh, that inheritance was. Uh, you know, he did state in his manifesto he did invest a bit in the cryptocurrency. So, again, I don't know how much capital he actually had to invest and how much he would have made, but his travels... Well, he, w- well he, wouldn't have, he wouldn't have made anything unless he, really. unless he pulled out in 2017. Yeah, or early, so, early last year, but well, when he takes off from uh, the gym in 2011, I mean, cryptocurrency wasn't really around yet. Uh, but this guy takes off on a, on travels across Asia, Europe. He he visited uh, the UK, France, Spain, Portugal, Bulgaria, Romania, Croatia, Hungary, Austria, Montenegro, and Serbia. I've been to most of those places. Croatia is very nice, by the way. If you're listening, if you want a little, uh, if you want to take a segment and just do a, a, a travel show, Croatia is actually lovely. It's very inexpensive, and nearly everybody speaks English. It's pretty cool. Anyways, go on. Yeah, I mean, these are pretty extensive travels for someone with no job at that point, uh, limited inheritance. Um, you know, tw- his travels get a bit fuzzy in the uh, the early years. You know whether it's news sources or government trying to track down exact dates. Uh, 2016 onward is more solid. Uh, Back in March uh, 2016, he ended up going to Turkey for three days, on the 17th to 20th. Okay, now just to to back up a little bit, there's, um, just to back up a little bit, uh, for for people who who don't travel a great deal, uh, you can fly to Europe... And you, they will stamp your passport if you land in England or Spain or Germany or whatever. Right? You do not need a visa to go to visit those countries. If you're an American or any any of um, uh, what are considered the, the golden passport countries, which is like it's the United States, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, the Western countries, right? You can go anywhere and nobody will ever check you. But Turkey is is one nation that you do have to have a visa to go into. They're easy to get. The first time I went to uh, Turkey, I, I actually crossed the border on foot, and I paid $25 for a, a, a visa on the spot, and they let me right in. So it's not hard, but the point is, is that when that visa is issued and when they scan your passport, that stuff gets documented. All right, goes into a database somewhere. So I just wanted to to make that clear that when we talk about this guy and his travels, you can travel all over Europe without ever having anybody stamp your passport. In fact, it's kind of one of the things that's a bummer is that like if you fly to England, when you cross over into France, they don't stamp your passport. And when you travel from France to Germany or fr- you know France to Spain to Portugal, you don't get a you don't get any marks in your passport. It's kind of sad because it's like that's kind of the fun of it is collecting stamps. But uh, as we talk about this, it's uh, we're going to get into some things that are going to stick out a little bit. But it, it's important to to point out why it sticks out, right? So this guy from Australia 
He's traveling all over Europe, and we don't know where he traveled. And the reason why we don't know where he traveled is because if you have an Australian passport, nobody's going to check. Nobody's going to look at your paperwork, you know? So anyways, go on. Okay. Uh, during his time in Turkey, uh, things allegedly got a little weird. Um, during the time he was there, apparently the German embassy and Turkish authorities uh, received information about a possible terror threat. Uh, bomb goes off, uh, killing three, injuring ten on the last day that Terran is there. Uh, no group claimed responsibility. It was barely covered by the, uh, the news. Uh, immediately, he takes off to Israel for nine days. Um, now, after Israel, and uh, who's yeah. who verified that he he went from Turkey to Israel? I believe it was ABC News Australia. Okay. There, there's a couple publications that went over his travels in 2016. So they did get a hold of his of his uh, passport records. It, they did, yeah. Uh, um, he... After Israel, uh, not sure where he goes, but he returns to Turkey. Uh, September 13th all the way to October 25th. Uh, during the same year, he also visits uh, Bulgaria, Romania, and Hungary. Uh, the same year, he also makes a sizable donation to an alleged white national or white nationalist group in Austria. Were they able to Were they able to trace Were they able to verify that he actually? transferred that money I mean that's because now you're talking yeah. about the only way to know that that happened is if it was electronic yeah they, they did have a number uh, I believe it was $1,700 okay and do we have I mean that, that term white nationalist and Nazi and, and you know racist yeah. and all that stuff it's like do we know who he gave the money to do we know anything about that organization Honestly, I'd have to look into them. I don't have a lot of information on the uh, the far right group in, in Austria. All right, because I mean, far right these days just means anybody who's to the right of Bernie Sanders. It's like, well, it's, yeah. all right, you know, you throw that word around. People call you know uh, pe people call me uh, alt right, and it's like, yeah. First off, I don't even know what that means. And, well, that's, yeah. that's, that's why I, that's why I said alleged. Yeah, allegedly. Alleged. Okay, and then what? So, so then he goes to Austria and donates some money in the memory of Adolf Hitler, allegedly. And then what? Yeah. Um, we don't quite know uh, where he goes after that. Um, the only thing in 2016, uh, different publications, journalists uh, went data mining. They found some of the fragments of his old social, social media dating back to April 2016. Um, you know, in that social media, apparently he was associated with a lot of far right groups. So this would have, he would have been 25 or 26 years old. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, he does move to, uh, New Zealand, uh, 2017. All right. Okay. He moved to, uh, doomed in, uh, and he lived there for one and a half years up until the attack. All right. Uh, actually, when he did move there, he paid eight months' rent up front. Um, you know, and during the time he did stay in that residence, uh, his neighbors said uh, he had no visitors, no friends, no romantic partners whatsoever the entire time he was there. A weird kid. That is weird. Yeah, even his landlord said, you know, when he went in for inspections, um, he had no personal effects around uh, around the home. Uh, all he had was a mattress in the living room. Huh. So, so a little bit weird. Is there any more on his parents? What like what his? Because I have one person write in and they said, "Hey, I'm from the same town as this guy in Australia." And let me tell you that like we're just a small town. We don't have we don't have any extremes one way or the other. Like there's this really doesn't make a lot of sense. I mean, uh, you know if his. No, I I think Grafton is only, I think it's about 18,000 people. Yeah, that's a village. That's that's barely more than a village. There's 12,000 people that live in Malibu, California. Yeah. It's very small. Um, 
so so his dad's dying from asbestos poisoning so I'm, I'm assuming probably leukemia yeah probably some sort of cancer some sort of cancer it was his mom on the scene where they were they grew up in a double parent household he did grow up in a, a two parent household um it's, it seems his, uh, his early life was uh, pretty stable. It was okay. What's this about? Uh, was somebody saying that he went to North Korea? Uh, he did go to North Korea and Pakistan in 2018. Last year? Just last year, yeah. So he, whilst living in New Zealand, he gets on a plane and visits uh, two places that are nearly impossible to get into, even with a golden passport. Correct. Yeah, right. I mean both both states are known for state-sponsored terrorism, harboring terrorists. North Korea, in particular, you know, has um, has always been bad for uh, you know cyber espionage, uh, sponsoring terrorism, and you know, threatening the entire world with nuclear Armageddon. Just, just again, so everybody knows, and I don't want to get too far into in in uh, Am I saying that word right? I don't know. I haven't had enough coffee. Um, it, it's nearly impossible if if you go to if you get a visa for North Korea, you you have to have business there. You have to. It's um, North Korea is 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 run like a prison, right? You can't just you can't just walk into a prison. You can't just visit a prison, even if you know people in it. Like you have to show up, you have to fill out paperwork, you have to announce yourself, and then you have to be approved. Uh, Dennis Rodman gets to go to North Korea because he's famous, really, really famous. And, you know, Donald Trump gets to go there because he's famous too. But you and me, no, there's, there's, there's no sightseeing there. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's very difficult. And if you're a whitey McWhiterson, this is verified by a lot of people who've been there. If you're in North Korea, they assign people to follow you around. And they don't try to hide either. They're like, yeah, we're following you around. You better not be taking pictures of what's actually going down here. Because we don't want people to see how awful this, you know, our little culture is here. So the fact that he gained access to North Korea being a nobody, right? He's not, he's, he's not some, you know altruist he's not you know what i mean he's not working for greenpeace he's you know he the last time he had a job he was 20 years old and at this point in the in the story he's 27 28 years old it's like dude you've been unemployed for no less than seven years and then all of a sudden you're going to to north korea and pakistan and again pakistan listen if you even ask like if you're in the united states canada australia whatever if you even ask your government may i please go to pakistan north korea you get put on a list immediately it doesn't matter what the what what the thing is it's like if you if you vocalize your desire to go to one of those places you people start looking at you hey buddy why do you want to go there you know what I mean? <laughs> like, uh, even if it's just because you're a you're a, you're a big fan of riding bikes. You know, I have I have travel friends that they like to do endurance things, like ride their bike all the way across the continent. You know, from Spain to you know the co- you know the the, the 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 coast of China. Well, you got to go through Pakistan to do that. You know, and you have to you know you have to explain yourself to not only their government but your own government. Because it's like, well, why are you there? So this begs the question, right? If our own governments, the people that, that we elect and sometimes don't elect to, to, to keep our nation safe, if you vocalize the, the, the desire to visit a place like North Korea, your own government is going to keep their eye on you. Because immediately it's like, yeah, there's the fact that you desire that is weird. Not saying that it's bad, but it... Certainly could work out that way. So the fact that this guy, who doesn't have a job, he doesn't have any any professional. I'm, I'm assuming he didn't go to college. No, he so, has no post secondary. Okay, so he's not an aerospace engineer. He's not a surgeon. He's he's none of those things. 
He's not a travel blogger. He's not. He's not anything, and yet, you know, put it all together, he's a guy who, you know, his dad dies, would you say, in 2010? Yeah, 2010. By way of suicide, and then he falls off the planet, and he's bouncing around Europe, and then he moves to Australia or uh, New Zealand, and then once in New Zealand, in his in his uh, unfurnished apartment, where he doesn't speak to anybody. He decides to get on a plane, and instead of visiting, you know, uh, uh, St. Gallen, Switzerland, right? Instead of uh, visiting the uh, the waterfalls there in Brazil, those really famous ones. No, his vacation spot is North Korea and Pakistan. And then once he's done with those with visiting those places, he decides to go home and shoot up two two separate mosques. So as you can see, there's there's uh, there's a whole basket of questions that that raises. So what do you think about all that, Adam? Well, considering his travel, uh, that he hasn't worked at that point in like eight years, um, you know, it's it's really weird, you know, for anyone. Yeah, where was uh, he getting the no, money? No matter, yeah, no matter how eccentric that person is, I mean, he just. Funding all those travels, accommodations, food, toiletries, you name it. Um, he's going to burn through that inheritance or whatever investments he's made quite quickly. Well, and if he was if he was traveling to Pakistan and North Korea in 2018, he would have already have, have experienced about a 90 percent loss in whatever cryptos he was holding. You know, if it was from. I mean, unless he unless he bought Bitcoin in like two thousand and twelve, yeah, when it was you know pennies. That I that I could see, and 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 by I don't know if I told you this or not, but this show it actually started off as a cryptocurrency show. Oh, no kidding! Yeah, it was um, in, in December of twenty seventeen when I started this podcast. It was called the Cryptocurrently Podcast. And uh, a lot, all of my dedicated listeners, like the people that I talk to on a regular basis who, you know, they, they talk back and forth on, on Twitter, we talk back and forth on Telegram and that sort of thing. Those are all cryptocurrency people. So this conversation is resonating with a lot of people. It's like, well, and this is the, this is the problem with uh, <laughs> just a little, little sidestep here, a little rabbit hole uh, journey. This is the problem with the cryptocurrency market is that we don't have any way of finding out. We don't have any right to dig into this, you know, we don't we can't go to we can't find out where his crypto was being stored, what wallets he was using, what platforms he was trading on. We can't go back and see like when did you buy this? How is it that you have so much money? You know, Whatever money you had, it lost 90% of its value in 2018. But you still would have a lot of money, like if you bought $10,000 worth of Bitcoin when it was a nickel, you know, or whatever the whatever it was back in the day. We can't we can't look into any of that stuff. It's it would be like trying to pull somebody's medical records. It's like, no, you can't have access to that. Um you know, in an unregulated market, you don't you can't call up Binance or, you know, whatever and say, hey, we want to know more about this guy's trading activity and history. So it, 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 there's, again, one of the biggest problems that I had from the very beginning of this is like, you, you can't just, like when people snap, right? Because people snap all the time. If you ever, you know, like, one of the most famous movies about losing your shit was um, Falling Down with Michael Douglas in it. Uh, if you ever saw that movie, it's a really good movie, but it's it's about a guy who gets pushed too far, and he just snaps and he just starts wasting people, right? Uh, the, the, the thing is, is that uh, it, it's one thing if you lose your mind. I remember when I was a kid, one of America's first mass shootings happened in my city. In San Diego, this was in the early 1980s, in a town of San Diego called Chula Vista, and a guy uh, 
walked into a McDonald's and started shooting everybody. A bunch of people died. Turns out that this man was a postal worker. That happened in my town. That is literally where we get the phrase going postal from. It was from that incident. And that happened in my city, and I remember when it happened. This postal worker, and because one of the things was, you know, w when that happened in the 80s, the McDonald's shooting from the guy from the post office, everybody started asking themselves, why did this guy snap? Right? Because that's the natural thing to do. When you see something, like we are, our minds are built for pattern recognition. And when we have uh, stimulus, like when we're given problems to solve, we immediately, our minds go immediately to trying to solve those problems. So this guy walks into a McDonald's, kills a bunch of people. And, and naturally, the first question in people's minds was, well, why did he do this? What could have possibly gone so wrong in this man's life that... Murdering a bunch of innocent people eating Big Macs seemed to him the right thing to do. And the answers that they first came up with, and this was on the news and lawyers and psychologists were talking about it, they said, well, best we can figure was that he worked at the post office, which is, out of all of the tedious uh, bureaucracy jobs that you could possibly have, being a postal worker has got to be number one. You're just doing the same thing day in, day out. Put the, put the envelope here, take it from there, put the envelope here, take it from there. You know, in, day in, day out. And maybe the, the, the theory was, well, his job must have just, go, just drove him crazy. Like literally people, when we talk about going postal, that story is literally where we get that phrase from or that term from. Right, So when we look at this guy, this 28-year-old guy who has apparently been losing his shit for no less than, I don't know, three years? Right? Because he, 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 we don't know anything about him from the age of 20 till about the age of 25. We don't know anything about him. We don't, there's nothing particularly out of step with his life. He lost his dad. His dad evidently owned some property or perhaps he had been paying into a life insurance fund for, for quite a while and there was a, a decent amount of money on the table and then this guy decides, you know what, I'm just going to go put on a backpack and go find myself. I'm flying to Europe, baby. I'm just going to backpack. I'm going to talk to new people, experience. I'm going to eat different food, talk to people of different religions. I'm just going to try to find myself. Now, people do that all the time. I've done that, Right? So there's really nothing noteworthy about this guy up until about two years ago when he when he shoves off to New Zealand, gets an apartment, and nobody has anything warm or kind to say about him other than he just keeps to himself. He doesn't talk to anybody, and he doesn't have any furniture, and he's a he's a weirdo. This is this is where the story picks up. This guy shows up after five or six years of traveling. In a country where he doesn't know anybody, everybody thinks he's weird, and he's buying plane tickets off to Pakistan and North Korea and getting in and coming back. And then he shoots up two mosques. It, it, it causes the brain to say, well, wait a minute, why? You know? Why did, it, why did this guy do this? Was it because of he was crazy because he... Uh, because his father decided to, to no longer endure the pain and just end his own life? I, I, I don't know. I, I don't think so, because that happens to a lot of people. You know, there, there's, there's a lot fishy about this. Was he, was he, uh, did he undergo some sort of indoctrination process on his travels? You know, did, uh, did he fall victim to uh, you know the the leftist ideology that all white people are bad and and he should be ashamed of himself for the color of his skin and you know whatever did he get indoctrinated into you know uh, the West is the great Satan and needs to be taken down or whatever you know who knows 
but it's the, that that pattern. What we do know is this: is that that in this whole smelly recipe of of bullshit cake, his trips to his trips to Pakistan and North Korea are baked into that cake. His moving of his residence from Australia to New Zealand is baked into that. Not to mention the fact that when he gets to New Zealand, he decides to he decides first thing that he's got to do is arm himself. Which is another thing. Do you want to get into that a little bit right now? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, apparently, uh, he tried to get his firearm slice or license uh, twice. Uh, the first time he did fail. Uh, he had to provide uh, a reference of a family member that resided in New Zealand. Uh, he failed to produce one, uh, so he was denied. Uh, the second time he applied, uh, he produced two references in New Zealand. Um, then he acquired it in November 2017. Do we know anything about those references? No. Okay. Well, I'm assuming that the uh, New Zealand authorities are going to be on that. Well, what was weird was, you know, their firearms laws are, are quite similar to Canada. Um, in fact, they seem to be a little more extreme because applying for your firearms license requires a visit uh, from the police. Huh. So if, if I'm an officer going over to his home and I'm only seeing a mattress in the living room and no personal effects anywhere else, uh, that, that might raise a flag. Oh, you mean like uh, if a bunch of... Uh... People from Saudi Arabia are taking flying lessons in San Diego, but they have absolutely no interest in learning how to land. Yeah. Yeah. By the way, that actually happened. Uh, anyways, so yeah, so so there is a policeman somewhere that went to his house. Yeah. Uh, I want to talk to that guy. I want to. Well, I don't want to talk to him. I want to hear from him. I want him to. I want him to be on TV and explain why it was that when he left that very weird guy in his weird life, he thought, yeah, this guy seems legit. This guy's not going to hurt anybody. This is very normal to just have a mattress. No pictures, no books, no TV, no, you know. <laughs> um, and, and the other thing, the two references. I want to know who those people are. And if those things if those things don't get produced, you know, because again, I can't. I, I the way I feel about most of this stuff, about the story that we're being told, is that I feel like I'm being shoehorned, right? Like when uh, when the terrorist camp was found in New Mexico by a bunch of Muslim radicals who had buried their dead baby on that land and didn't report it to anybody. When those people were arrested while they were in jail being processed and awaiting bail and all that stuff, uh, somebody saw fit to go out and bulldoze that camp. Somebody saw fit to go out there and just destroy the evidence, you know, uh, before, you know, uh, what are those shows with the forensic people, you know, the, the crime scene shows? You know, oh, the CSI shows. The, the CSI shows, right? With that with that yeah. with that dude with the red hair who lives in Miami, you know. Oh, yeah, Horatio. <laughs> Horatio, right? Before yeah. before Horatio, the, the, the red headed uh uh porcelain white skin guy who's decided to live in Miami, uh shows up and, and finds the microfibers, you know, or whatever it is that he does. Somebody goes out and bulldozes this terrorist training camp. It's like, okay, I need to hear from the guy driving the bulldozer why did you do that who told you to do that and then i need to know who that guy works for something you just shoehorned me into i i you've just you've just taken away my ability to ask questions because you destroyed the evidence there's no set of circumstances now that that any evidence found at that terrorist training camp in new mexico by a bunch of muslim radicals there's no evidence that can be gathered there anymore because the bulldozer went over it. It's all it's all useless. I've been shoehorned and I don't like that. So here we have this guy where like in his country, and by the way, yes, everybody, I apologize. 
When I first did the video, I had a completely different understanding of what gun laws in New Zealand was like. I'm sorry. All right? But the fact is, they're a hell of a lot more strict than they are in the United States. Right? That whole thing that Adam just described, that does not happen in the United States. We don't do that. There's no policeman showing up. There's no nothing. You fill out a, you fill out a form. You, you pay your 10 bucks or whatever and you mail it in. And within a few days, they mail it back and then you go down to the, to the gun store and you show it to the guy and you buy your gun. That's how it works. And there's even arguments about whether that should be allowed. But in New Zealand, you, a policeman has to get... Let me, let me explain something to you about this, by the way. New Zealand. Has, how many people live in New Zealand? I think it's around like four, four and a half, five million. You're kidding. Okay, so where I'm from... San Diego, California has just under 4 million people. So evidently we're about the same size and population, right? In San Diego, if your car gets stolen and you report it, the police do not show up to your house. They, you, you get a phone call with somebody who's not a police person. They're just a person who answers the phone. They write your information down and then that's the end of it. That's all there is. So for everybody to own a gun in New Zealand, everybody has to get a visit from a police officer. All right, logistically, that sounds like a nightmare. You know, because you're going to have 10, 20, maybe 30,000 people, you know, are going to be police officers, you know, like in, in well, I don't know what the numbers are, but it's not very many. So a policeman would have had to have gone to this man's house and interviewed him. Where is this policeman? I want to see him. Have any of you heard from this guy? On top of that, uh, it's mandatory. You have to have two references. And, and furthermore, he would have already had it in the system that he got denied once. For Was it falsely putting... Did, did, you know... Did, the, the, the uh, do you know the story behind that? I don't know the full story behind the first application. But all we know is that it was denied. It was denied, yeah. Oh, all right. Um, you know, so, you know, again, you have to provide references. You have to have a visit. There is a background check. And you have to prove to the officer that your domicile can safely store firearms. Um, you know, that the, the firearms are going to be in a container. Uh, that would be really hard to compromise. So, you know, yeah, there's, an, there's an inspection as well. Oh, and of course he wouldn't have had, you know, if he didn't have any furniture or anything like that. So this guy just shows up and maybe, maybe he had bought a little safe from, you know, the local office supply store. And this policeman shows up and sees that this guy has nothing but a mattress and a safe. Yeah. yeah, nothing to see here, folks. Move along. Yeah, it stinks. That whole that that whole thing stinks in the light. Now you could be now it's fair, to be fair. We are talking about bureaucracies. Where things fall through the cracks all the time. You can make that case, and you'd probably be right. All right? Well, maybe maybe the cop was hung over. Maybe the lady who was processing his second application, you know, she just looked up the two references, saw something that, that gave her the impression that it was okay to give the green light. It just went through the cracks. All right. That's fair. But let's keep in mind a couple of other things. All of the manifestos and, and videos have been scrubbed from the planet. And New Zealand is right now engaged in, confisca in confiscations of guns. And a man has already lost his life in that effort. At least one. The people of New Zealand are having their, their right to protect themselves by any means necessary taken away from them. That is a God-given right. It's in your very DNA. It's called the, the fight or flight mode. You are free to protect yourself and those that are in your charge by any means necessary. And now that's that's being removed. So and and we're going to get into that at another time, perhaps on the next episode. 
getting into the fact that uh, New Zealand had 600 pages worth of new legislation ready to go. What was it, within 24 hours of the shooting? Uh, yeah, I think within 24 hours. They were ready to implement it within, I think, 10 days of the shooting. Okay. Or at least looking at it seriously within 10 days. All right, so, yeah, that's, you know, when you talk about gun confiscation and burning books, or, or as we say these days scrubbing information from the internet yeah. when these when the, when all of these factors are happening at the same time and happening around one event you have to ask yourself a, a lot of very uncomfortable questions so again this is why we we've decided to start from the beginning all right number one let's point out that a nearly impossible task of scrubbing information off of the internet happened on a global scale within hours. That was a coordinated event. There's no other way of seeing it. There's no other way of seeing that. You cannot look at that and see it any other way than that was a coordinated event. People that work at, at Microsoft do not work with the people at Google and they do not work with the people at Facebook. And those people don't work with the people at Gab AI. They don't work together. They're different entities. They're different people. They, they work on different streets. This information was scrubbed from the internet within hours. And on top of that, this weirdo was let into Pakistan and North Korea in the same year. And on top of that, he bought guns in New Zealand where there's a whole bureaucratic process and was greenlit. For guns. Nobody says anything. For what? Right? What would be the end goal? If you were playing chess and these were all chess moves, what would be the end goal? Would it not be to disarm the public? Would it not be to disarm the public so that they would be more easily subduable? Right, and we're not. Uh, see again, it's it's very difficult to not go down rabbit holes. It's like, who is this prime minister lady? Why why is there a rave DJ running a nation? It, you know, the, it, it, there's a lot. You know, I, again, I don't I don't want to go all rabbit holes. So that's um, you want to leave it there for for today. Just talking about what we talked about with this guy. What's his name again? Oh, uh, Brenton Tarrant. Brenton. Okay, number one, yeah. what kind of name is Brenton? What kind of asshole names uh, their kid Brenton? Terrence. There, there, there was a, a bit of a weird thing uh, with his firearm license. So uh, he was given a general license, a Class A, which is for sporting rifles. What okay. it doesn't cover is military-style uh, semi-automatics uh, pistols. They fall under a restricted. Uh, you need a Class E. And you have to tell the police and give them a reason why you need those firearms, whether it's uh, IPSC, you're doing a three-gun competition, um, you know, hunting purposes uh, where you would need one. So, you know, the New Zealand government stated that, you know, his license covered the firearms that he used in the attack, and that's simply not the case. I mean, anybody could just go as far as Wikipedia and look up, New Zealand firearms licenses, you know, um, right there. <laughs> it's it's kind of nuts. But there would also be documentation, that, like if there's a form to fill out for a license, and on that form you have to explain why do you want this. Yeah. In in a place where, unlike America, uh, I could just write in there, well, it's none of your damn business. But evidently in New Zealand, you have to write down, well, because uh, I belong to a uh, target shooting club. And I, uh, what were some of the other things that would be permissible, like hunting? Uh, Not hunting. hunting. I'm sure. I'm sure that's rare. Uh, I I doubt there's very many people going in the backwoods of New Zealand with an AR. Um, you know, this is it's the same deal though in Australia uh, or England. You can have pistols. You can, I believe, have an AR type rifle, but you have to get the police a very good reason be part of a club, uh, be part of a group like IPSC, um, you know, to have one. What is Ips and, What is IPSC? Oh, it's the, um, 
Oh, it's failing to come to memory here. It, it's it's competitive shooting. It's okay. It's essentially speed shooting. Oh, uh, okay. Three gun, you know, three gun competition, uh, pistol, usually AR or shotgun. It's a uh, timed event. Um, you know, and you transition through the weapons. It's a, a timed course. But somewhere there's there has to be a document of this guy's explanation that he gave the government of New Zealand on why he needed. Uh, yeah, pistols like and... even looking into whether he was a member of a, um, you know, a gun club or a range, uh, the police initially uh, couldn't give me information about that. Uh, you know, there has been some information released to uh, the media that I picked up. Uh, he was a member of Bruce Rifle Club. Um, you know, apparently a, a New Zealand Army vet uh, spoke to the media uh, there. Uh, complaining about that club, um, you know, saying it was filled with kind of the mall ninja type that were always talking about zombie apocalypses and, and homicide. There was no muzzle discipline. It was very unprofessional. And he ended up actually complaining to the police. So the huh. range that Brent, Brenton was going to uh, should have been under the eyeballs of the police in New Zealand. Mm. I'm telling you, man, there's nothing that you can look at in any part of the story that doesn't immediately uh, fill your nostrils with stench. Well, it doesn't sound that it doesn't sound like he's going to get the the training that he needed, um, you know, for the firearms handling he displayed in the video. You know, transitioning between shotgun, AR. Mag swaps, clearing okay, stoppages. see that's that's the problem again with the story is that you're you're it drags you into different rabbit holes. That's what I think that we should talk about tomorrow. Was um, uh, there's a number of problems with the way that this man handled his firearms, and yeah. uh, I think we're just gonna have to leave it at that. Tune in tomorrow. We're gonna we're gonna we're gonna dissect the actual shooting and the problems with that particular narrative uh, tomorrow on tomorrow's show. Please hit subscribe. Please support the show with cash money at paypal.me slash archadvocate. Paypal.me slash archadvocate. Hit share to your social media. Tell your friends, man. Tell your friends that you're listening to the greatest podcast in the world, according to Pete Dobson. Thank you, Adam, for once again showing up. Uh, I, I, like I told you, man, I'm going to take as much of your time as you're going to give me because I want to. I, I, there's, there's something more that needs to be said about this story, and I want to get to it, whatever it is, wherever it takes us. Thank you so yeah, much for joining us today, and hopefully, we'll have you back on the show tomorrow. No problem. I'm with you all the way on this one. All right, brother. That's the show for today. We'll talk to you tomorrow. <laughs>